Daylight. Danny awoke with a mood gasp from a terrible dream. There had been an explosion. A re. The overlook was burning up. He and his mommy were watching it from the front lawn. Mommy had said, look, Danny, look at the hedges. He looked at them and they were all dead. Their leaves had turned a sucant brown. The tightly packed branches showed through like the skeletons of half-dismembered corpses. And then his daddy had burst out of the overlook's big double doors, and he was burning like a torch. His clothes were in aims, his skin had acquired a dark and sinister tan that was growing darker by the moment, his hair was a burning bush. That was when he woke up, his throat tight with fear, his hands clutching at the sheet and blankets. Had he screamed? He looked over at his mother. Wendy lay on her side, the blankets up to her chin, a sheaf of straw-colored hair lying against her cheek. She looked like a child herself. No, he hadn't screamed. Lying in bed, looking upward, the nightmare began to drain away. He had a curious feeling that some great tragedy, re. Explosion, had been averted by inches. He let his mind drift out, searching for his daddy, and found him standing somewhere below. In the lobby. Danny pushed a little harder, trying to get inside his father. It was not good. Because daddy was thinking about the bad thing. He was thinking how, good just one or two would be I don't care sons over the yardarm somewhere in the world remember how we used to say that Al. Gin and tonic bourbon with just a dash of bitter scotch and soda rum and coke tweedledum and tweedledee a drink for me and a drink for thee the Martians have landed somewhere in the world Princeton or Houston or Stokely on Carmichael some fucking place after all tis the season and none of us are, get out of his mind, you little shit. He recoiled in terror from that mental voice, his eyes widening, his hands tightening into claws on the counterpane. It hadn't been the voice of his father but a clever mimic. A voice he knew. Hoarse, brutal, yet underpointed with a vacuous sort of humor. Was it so near, then? He threw the covers back and swung his feet out onto the oar. He kicked his slippers out from under the bed and put them on. He went to the door and pulled it open and hurried up to the main corridor, his slippered feet whispering on the nap of the carpet runner. He turned the corner. There was a man on all fours halfway down the corridor, between him and the stairs. Danny froze. The man looked up at him. His eyes were tiny and red. He was dressed in some sort of silvery, spangled costume. A dog costume, Danny realized. Protruding from the rump of this strange creation was a long and oppy tail with a P.U. on the end. A zipper ran up the back of the costume to the neck. To the left of him was a dog's or wolf's head, blank eye sockets above the muzzle, the mouth open in a meaningless snarl that showed the rug's black and blue pattern between fangs that appeared to be papier-mâché. The man's mouth and chin and cheeks were smeared with blood. He began to growl at Danny. He was grinning, but the growl was real. It was deep in his throat, a chilling primitive sound. Then he began to bark. His teeth were also stained red. He began to crawl toward Danny, dragging his boneless tail behind him. The costume dog's head lay unheeded on the carpet, glaring vacantly over Danny's shoulder. Let me by. Danny said. I'm going to eat you, little boy, the dogman answered, and suddenly a fusillade of barks came from his grinning mouth. They were human imitations, but the savagery in them was real. The man's hair was dark, greased with sweat from his conning costume. There was a mixture of scotch and champagne on his breath. Danny inched back but didn't run. Let me by. Not by the hair of my chinny-chin-chin, chin, the dogman replied. 
His small red eyes were XED attentively on Danny's face. He continued to grin. I'm going to eat you up, little boy. And I think I'll start with your plump little cock. He began to prance skittishly forward, making little leaps and snarling. Danny's nerve broke. He edged back into the short hallway that led to their quarters, looking back over his shoulder. There was a series of mixed howls and barks and growls, broken by slurred mutterings and giggles. Danny stood in the hallway, trembling. Get it up, the drunken dogman cried out from around the corner. His voice was both violent and despairing. Get it up, Harry you bitch bastard. I don't care how many casinos and airlines and movie companies you own. I know what you like in the privacy of your own age home. Get it up. I'll who, and I'll pee you, until Harry Derwent's all blown down. He ended with a long, chilling howl that seemed to turn into a scream of rage and pain just before it dwindled Oh, Danny turned apprehensively to the closed bedroom door at the end of the hallway and walked quietly down to it. He opened it and poked his head through. His mommy was sleeping in exactly the same position. No one was hearing this but him. He closed the door softly and went back up to the intersection of their corridor and the main hall, hoping the dogman would be gone, the way the blood on the walls of the presidential suite had been gone. He peeked around the corner carefully. The man in the dog costume was still there. He had put his head back on and was now prancing on all fours by the stairwell, chasing his tail. He occasionally leaped over the rug and came down making dog grunts in his throat. Woof. Woof. Bow wow wow. Jarrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrr
Outside the snow came harder, curtaining them all from the world. Mid-air Dick Haloran's eye was called at 6.45 a.m. EST, and the boarding clerk held him by gate 31, shifting his eye bag nervously from hand to hand, until the last call at 6.55. They were both looking for a man named Carlton Vecker, the only passenger on TWA's Flight 196 from Miami to Denver who hadn't checked in. Okay, the clerk said, and issued Haloran a blue RST class boarding pass. You lucked out. You can board, sir. Haloran hurried up the enclosed boarding ramp and let the mechanically grinning stewardess tear his pass o and give him the stub. We're serving breakfast on the eye, the stew said. If you'd like, just co e, babe, he said, and went down the aisle to a seat in the smoking section. He kept expecting the no-show Vecker to pop through the door like a jack-in-the-box at the last second. The woman in the seat by the window was reading you can be your own best friend with a sour, unbelieving expression on her face. Haloran buckled his seatbelt and then wrapped his large black hands around the seat's armrests and promised the absent Carlton Vecker that it would take him and V strong TWA eyed attendants to drag him out of his seat. He kept his eye on his watch. It dragged all the minutes to the 7 o'clock Takeo time with maddening slowness. At 7.05 the stewardess informed them that there would be a slight delay while the ground crew rechecked one of the latches on the cargo door. Shit for brains, Dick Haloran muttered. The sharp-faced woman turned her sour, unbelieving expression on him and then went back to her book. He had spent the night at the airport, going from counter to counter, United, American, TWA, Continental, Brawny, haunting the ticket clerks. Sometime after midnight, drinking his eighth or ninth cup of koi in the canteen, he had decided he was being an asshole to have taken this whole thing on his own shoulders. There were authorities. He had gone down to the nearest bank of telephones, and after talking to three direct operators, he had gotten the emergency number of the Rocky Mountain National Park Authority. The man who answered the telephone sounded utterly worn out. Haloran had given a false name and said there was trouble at the Overlook Hotel, west of Sidewinder. Bad trouble. He was put on hold. The ranger, Haloran assumed he was a ranger, came back on in about V minutes. They've got a CB, the ranger said. Sure they've got a CB, Haloran said. We haven't had a mayday call from them. Man, that don't matter. They, exactly what kind of trouble are they in, Mr. Hall? Well, there's a family. The caretaker and his family. I think maybe he's gone a little nuts, you know. I think maybe he might hurt his wife and his little boy. May I ask how you've come by this information, sir? Haloran closed his eyes. What's your name, fellow? Tom Staunton, sir. Well, Tom, I know. Now I'll be just as straight with you as I can be. There's bad trouble up there. Maybe killin' bad, do you dig what I'm saying? Mr. Hall, I really have to know how you, look, Haloran had said. I'm telling you I know. A few years back there was a fellow up there name of Grady. He killed his wife and his two daughters and then pulled the string on himself. I'm telling you it's going to happen again if you guys don't haul your asses out there and stop it. Mr. Hall, you're not calling from Colorado. No. But what dirance, if you're not in Colorado, you're not in CB range of the Overlook Hotel. If you're not in CB range you can't possibly have been in contact with the, uh, faint rattle of papers. The Torrance family. While I had you on hold I tried to telephone. It's out, which is nothing unusual. There are still 20 VE miles of above-ground telephone lines between the hotel and the Sidewinder switching station. 
My conclusion is that you must be some sort of crank. Oh man, you stupid, but his despair was too great to end the a noun to go with the adjective. Suddenly, illumination. Call them, he cried. Sir. You got the CB, they got the CB. So call them. Call them and ask them what's up. There was a brief silence, and the humming of long-distance wires. You tried that too, didn't you? Haloran asked. That's why you had me on hold so long. You tried the phone and then you tried the CB and you didn't get nothing but you don't think nothing's wrong. What are you guys doing up there? Sitting on your asses and playing gin rummy? No, we are not, Staunton said angrily. Haloran was relieved at the sound of anger in the voice. For the RST time he felt he was speaking to a man and not to a recording. I'm the only man here, sir. Every other ranger in the park, plus game wardens, plus volunteers, are up in hasty notch, risking their lives because three stupid assholes with six months experience decided to try the north face of King's Ram. They're stuck halfway up there and maybe they'll get down and maybe they won't. There are two choppers up there and the men who are in them are risking their lives because it's night here and it's starting to snow. So if you're still having trouble putting it all together, I'll give you a hand with it. Number one, I don't have anybody to send to the Overlook. Number two, the Overlook isn't a priority here, what happens in the park is a priority. Number three, by daybreak neither one of those choppers will be able to why because it's going to snow like crazy, according to the National Weather Service. Do you understand the situation? Yeah, Haloran had said softly. I understand. Now my guess as to why I couldn't raise them on the CB is very simple. I don't know what time it is where you are, but out here it's 9.30. I think they may have turned it O and gone to bed. Now if you, good luck with your climbers, man, Haloran said. But I want you to know that they are not the only ones who are stuck up high because they didn't know what they were getting into. He had hung up the phone. At 7.20 a.m. the TWA 747 backed lumberingly out of its stall, turned, and rolled out toward the runway. Haloran let out a long, soundless exhale. Carlton Vecker, wherever you are, eat your heart out. Flight 196 parted company with the ground at 728, and at 731, as it gained altitude, the thought pistol went oh in Dick Haloran's head again. His shoulders hunched uselessly against the smell of oranges and then jerked spasmodically. His forehead wrinkled, his mouth drew down in a grimace of pain. Dick please come quick we're in bad trouble Dick W.E. need, and that was all. It was suddenly gone. No fading out this time. The communication had been chopped oh cleanly, as if with a knife. It scared him. His hands, still clutching the seat rests, had gone almost white. His mouth was dry. Something had happened to the boy. He was sure of it. If anyone had hurt that little child, do you always react so violently to Takeo's? He looked around. It was the woman in the horn-rimmed glasses. It wasn't that, Haloran said. I've got a steel plate in my head. From Korea. Every now and then it gives me a twinge. Vibrates, don't you know? Scrambles the signal. Is that so? Yes, ma'am. It is the line soldier who ultimately pays for any foreign intervention, the sharp-faced woman said grimly. Is that so? It is. This country must swear oh its dirty little wars. The CIA has been at the root of every dirty little war America has fought in this century. The CIA and dollar diplomacy. She opened her book and began to read. 
The Eno smoking sign went oh, Haloran watched the receding land and wondered if the boy was all right. He had developed an exionate feeling for that boy, although his folks hadn't seemed all that much. He hoped to God they were watching out for Danny.